And why does Christianity survive 2,004 years after his death? Was he a prophet, the son of God? How does he become this? Yeah, sure. It means that to you. An epic saga from the dawn of history. What or who was Jesus, as far as you're concerned? I think it's the it's a defining question for Christians. Who was Jesus? <laughs> I love that in our Bible, we have not one, not two, not three, but four tellings of the story of Jesus. And each of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are really telling the same story about the coming of God into human history, Jesus being born, his life with no sin, loving, serving, caring, his death on the cross for our sins in our place, three days in the tomb, his resurrection, and even what he taught and did after his resurrection, all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tell that same story, but they each tell it from sort of a unique perspective or a unique vantage point. And when you take these four tellings of the Jesus story and you bring them together, you get this whole big, beautiful picture of who Jesus is. In the, in the Gospel of John, one of the unique things is that John captures these miracles of Jesus. Jesus is the miracle-working teacher. So Jesus would work a miracle, but he would also teach. So Jesus could multiply bread, but he would teach, I'm the bread of life. Jesus would raise the dead, and he would say, I'm the resurrection and the life. So the Gospel of John shows us as this teaching miracle worker Jesus, and we get that unique perspective. And then a couple weeks ago, Pastor Sean talked about the Gospel of Mark. In the Gospel of Mark, we see that Jesus Christ is the servant son of God. God among us, yet humbly serving it's one of the unique things that comes to the Gospel of Mark. Last week we saw in Matthew that Jesus is the fulfillment of the prophecies. Over and over, Matthew would say, and these things happened to fulfill what the prophet has written, and then he would explain it. And Jesus fulfilled prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. And today we're going to open our Bibles to the book of Luke. And we're going to discover that Jesus Christ was the great storyteller. Jesus told story after story after story. And, and Jesus tells stories in all four of the Gospels. But it's interesting in Luke, there's lots of stories Jesus tells that are recorded only in the Gospel of Luke. And each story is meant to be transformational. It wasn't stories for the sake of entertainment. It was stories with a message to transform our hearts and our lives. And, and, and the reality is when it comes to stories, we all love stories. We tell stories and we know that stories have power. Stories are powerful. There's a story being told right now. It's been told in a public way for about three weeks. It's called Endgame. Marvel Comics. And you say, well, who's going to go, who's gonna go watch a, a comic book put into a movie telling a story about an Endgame? Here's the answer. Lots of people. All right. In three weeks, domestic ticket sales in the U.S., $748 million in three weeks. People like stories. Internationally, $1,748,000,000 in ticket sales. Over $2.5 billion in ticket sales in three weeks because people like stories. We do. And different people like different kinds, kinds of stories. Some of you are like, well, I'm more of a gladiator, brave heart kind of story person. I love, I love those stories. They resonate for me. Other people are like, I'm kind of like a, I'm kind of like a, I'm a, go, I'm a gone with the wind, sort of a Romeo and Juliet romance story type person. Uh, and even from childhood, we read children's stories. We tell children's stories. It's a wonderful little book called The Giving Tree. I remember reading that to my kids. And, and then there's a, little, there's a little kid's book called Good Night Moon. I have no idea what the story is there. It's just saying goodnight to things. Anybody remember Goodnight Moon? Goodnight Moon. Good night. It's not really a story, but it, it's sold a lot of copies. and has cute little pictures. But, but, we, but we, we love stories. And Jesus knew that. 
Jesus understood that stories captured truth. And stories locked into our memories and locked into our hearts. And so Jesus told many stories. So what we're going to do today is we're going to take the Gospel of Luke and we're going to look at four stories. Now there's a lot. If I don't get to your favorite story, we only have a short period of time. I'm sure it's a wonderful story. We're going to look at four stories. And in each case, we're going to have a member of the congregation read that story. Don't get nervous. I'm not calling on people randomly. They're already prepared to read. All right? And so uh, we're going to have four people read a story. And I invite our first reader to come and join us, if you would. Read a story. And then after they read the story, we're going to talk about what was Jesus saying? What's, what, what's some of the message Jesus is trying to get into our hearts? Then we're going to hear the story again and listen to it again and see if maybe we have fresh perspective. Then we're going to pray that the truth of that story will go deep in our hearts. And we're going to do that with four stories. And so prepare your heart because Jesus was a great storyteller. And you're going to hear a story of Jesus. Just listen, drink it in, and then we'll think about it together. Listen to the story of Jesus. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on the rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. And then Jesus says, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Pay attention. Hear the story. Some of the seed fell on good soil, and it was a bumper crop. It was a huge harvest. Some of the seed multiplied. But in this strange little story that Jesus is telling, the sower, this farmer goes out to sow the seed, and they throw the seed. Where? Everywhere. There's a road. Throw some seed. Hey, some weeds. Seed. A rocky path. Throw some seed. That soil looks good. Throw some seed. If you were living in the first century in Jesus' day, and you heard this story, you would think, that farmer, that sower has lost it. Because farmers didn't, didn't do that. Most farmers in the ancient world were very poor, and they lived harvest to harvest, crop to crop, and seed's expensive. It still is to this day. So they would plant the seed in good soil, not in the weeds, not on rocky paths. Not, I mean, they, they, they wouldn't do that. So here Jesus is, he's telling the story. He's trying to help us understand something because when you, when you read the whole story, what you find out is this. The sower, the farmer, is us. If you're a Christian, if you come to the cross and receive Jesus, you're the sower in this story. And the seed, we're told, is the word of God. It's God's truth. It's the, it's the story, the message of God. The story for us, the story of Jesus. And so Jesus is saying something in this story. When you understand what he's talking about, this, that this strange, generous farmer is just scattering seed everywhere. So here's a couple of insights from this story that could impact our lives. There's more you could see and find, but here's a couple of thoughts. Here's the first one. And it helps us understand that stories have power. God's good news is so good, we should scatter it everywhere. God's good news is so good. The truth of God's love and his grace is so good, we shouldn't walk around going, does this person look ready? Oh, maybe throw him a seat or two. We just should walk through our days scattering the stories of Jesus, scattering his love, scattering his grace. Where? Everywhere. Just, just scatter the sea. And the second little lesson ties right in with the first lesson as you understand the power of this story. Here's the second insight. We are not smart enough to know if a heart is good soil or bad. So, we go back to point one, we scatter everywhere. I really think what Jesus is trying to say to us is this. If you're his follower, and you have the seed of his word and his goodness and his love, don't spend time looking around, studying people, trying to figure out, is he ready? Is she seem like she's ready for me to share God's story, to share God's love? I think he's just saying, just wherever you go, scatter. Share God's love. Share his stories. Share about your faith. Share, share your life with people. Be generous. Be kind. Just, just scatter freely because we don't know. I learned this lesson as a young pastor. I was a youth pastor in a church in Southern California. There was this, this young woman in the church named Christina. And Christina, she loved Jesus. 
And she would just joyfully, wherever she went, she would just shine the light of Jesus. She'd share stories of Jesus. She would just scatter the seed. She would love people. She would serve people. She would tell them how much she loved Jesus. She'd invite people to youth group. She just, she just scattered the seed wherever she went. And she came across these two brothers, one of them that she went to school with. And they'd grown up in an atheistic home. They'd grown up in a home that was so so difficult. They actually, they had gone through, their, their mother was so afraid of their father that she had to run away with the kids. The father found them and literally shot her point blank with a shotgun. She lived. The father went to jail. And these boys just had a lot of hardness. They looked like bad soil. They looked like weedy soil. They, they, there was nothing about these two young guys that looked like receptive hearts to Jesus. But Christina didn't care. She just scattered seed. She invited them to youth group. And they came to youth group. The first time they came to youth group was to prove to her that Jesus wasn't real and God wasn't real and to try to destroy her faith. And they said to me, actually, we're working together to try to get her to not believe in Jesus. They told me that. Didn't look like good soil. Anybody hear me? But Christina didn't care. She just kept scattering, loving, serving, caring, telling her stories of faith. And the rest of us at the youth group, including me, got to do the same thing with these two young guys, these two high school guys. And lo and behold, their hearts were soft, receptive soil. Even though the outside looked tough, they both became Christians. And one of them went to seminary and has gone into ministry. You say, well, what if Christina would have looked at them and thought, do they look like they're ready? She wouldn't have thrown a single seed their way. But the story here is saying the farmer, us, we don't scatter seeds selectively. We just do it everywhere. So listen again to the story. And ask yourself, Jesus, what are you saying in this story? And what are you saying to me if I'm a follower of Jesus? Listen again to the story of Jesus. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on the rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. And so, Jesus, may we have ears to hear this story. And may we go out through our days and through our life scattering seed, even when a person looks hard-hearted, they look like rocky soil, they look resistant. Lord, we don't know if their heart is ready. So, Jesus, we pray that we would hear this story and we would walk through our days scattering your love and your truth, and your grace, and sharing your stories that could change the lives and the stories of other people forever. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So Jesus traveled, and he taught, and told story after story. Here's another story from the lips of Jesus. Listen closely, and let God speak to you. Listen to the story of Jesus. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave, gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. So Jesus is answering the question, who is my neighbor? And he tells a story, because stories have power. Stories lock, lock truths deep in our soul. So Jesus tells a story. There's a guy who's just been ravaged, he's been beaten, he's been robbed, he's been left for dead on the side of the road in a kind of a deserted area. And along comes a religious person, a priest. And the priest comes along and sees the situation and carefully navigates around it and keeps on going. And Jesus says, and another person comes along, another religious person, somebody from the, from the priestly class, a Levite from the Levitical family. And then Levite comes along, a person of faith, a person of religion, a person who should care. And they come and they see the situation. And the second person kind of finds their way around the situation and just keeps on going. And then Jesus says, but a Samaritan, and you have to understand in the ancient world, to a Jewish audience that Jesus is speaking to, priests and Levites were the good guys. Samaritans were the people on the other side of the track, the people they didn't like, the people they didn't trust. 
the people they avoided. But along comes a Samaritan. And the Samaritan sees the need, and instead of navigating around the, 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 the Samaritan, the Bible says it took pity on him and cared and served and healed and picked the person up and brought them to an inn and said, hey, listen, you keep a tab on whatever this person needs. When I come back, I'll pay the whole bill off. Well, you hear that story. Jesus says, which one was the neighbor? Not hard to figure out, is it? But even the listeners, they didn't want to say the Samaritan because they didn't like even the, saying the words. So they said, well, the one who stopped and helped out. That's, you know. They didn't want to say the Samaritan. Jesus is teaching, is telling a story, and we still use this term today. Oh, that person's a good Samaritan. Somebody who stops and helps someone. There's even good Samaritan laws. The people, if you see a need, you're supposed to stop and help. It's the story that Jesus taught that brings that truth alive. So just a couple of insights from the story, because stories have power. If we hear them, let them sink into our hearts, they can change us. So here's one insight. Knowing what is right is not enough. We must take action. Just knowing what's right. Well, I go to church. Well, I read the Bible. I got the information. I got the data. I know how I'm supposed to act. That's enough. No, it's not. Not for Jesus. But you take action. The first two people took action. They avoided. The third one took action, stepped into the fray. If we understand who Jesus is, if we walk along with him, we know that Jesus would put it this way, talk is cheap. You know, I can tell you I love my wife. But if you watch me around my wife and I'm cold and negative and critical and show no kindness or gentleness, I can say I love my wife all day long. You're going to think that guy doesn't love his wife. You're watching what I do. And so Jesus, in the story, Jesus is saying, understand something. It's one thing to know what's right, but that's not enough. You've got to act on it. Here's a second lesson from this story. A good neighbor sees, feels, acts, and counts the cost. A good neighbor sees a need. But in the passage, it says the Samaritan took pity. We don't just see the need, we, feel, we let ourselves feel. So we can start to kind of isolate our hearts and, and put up resistance. And man, there's so much pain and struggle in the world. If I can just walk by quickly, not pay attention, I don't have to feel anything. But when you see and then you feel, what does that do? It leads you to do something. Action. And listen closely. It always costs you something. Always. It can cost you your time. It can cost money. It might cost your reputation. I can't believe she helped out a person like that. It's going to cost something every time you do this, but this is what it means to be a good neighbor. So Jesus says, a good neighbor, and if you're a follower of Jesus, this should be your lifestyle. And if you're not yet a follower and you become a Christian, God will call you to this, to see the needs around you, to let your heart feel, to take action when you can, when it's appropriate. And you have to use wisdom, but it doesn't mean everything I ever see I have to do, but we're always open. God, are you stirring my heart? Would you have me do something and to take action? And you say, but it's going to cost something. Yes, Jesus said, that's what following me does. It costs something because he gave everything for us. And so Jesus tells a story, stirring our hearts and calling us to a new place. So listen again to the story and let God speak to your heart. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. And Lord Jesus, we pray that we would recognize that in our brokenness, in our lostness, you came to us and you picked us up and you brought us home. You paid the price on the cross for all of our wrongs and sins. So if we call you our Savior, and if we follow you as the leader of our lives, we pray that you would teach us to see and to feel and to act on behalf of others. And Jesus, as we do this, we pray that you would receive the glory as we count the cost and learn what it means to serve those who are in need. Help us live a life that you would have us live, we pray in your name, Jesus. 
Amen. Jesus told story after story after story. Listen again and let God speak to you through a story of Jesus. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. It was a good year. Good year. This, this farmer had a bumper crop, maybe a couple of good years. And the response to all the blessing, the response to all the, the great harvest, the influx, the response to this goodness was not, how do I share it with God? It was not, how do I help people in need? What was the response? All big build, I will build bigger barns and store up all my stuff for the most important person I can think of, and that would be me. Now, I debated what pictures to pick and put up behind the reading of that passage uh, because most of us don't have that many shoes or that many cars. But you know what? Don't write yourself off from this one because all of us have moments where God blesses us and we have more than what we need. And what's our first response? How can I keep this for me? Or how might I bring glory to God? What's the first response? Bigger barns or a bigger heart? And so here's two lessons from this story. Here's one that I think Jesus would have us know and hear the power of this lesson. Know when enough is enough and share freely. Know when enough is enough. I don't know that for you and you don't know that for me, but God knows it for each one of us. And we can say to God, God, what's appropriate for me? What's enough for me and for my family? If we're not careful, if we don't decide how much is enough, then nothing will ever be enough. I've got a friend of mine in ministry, his father, through his, his father's whole life, he has worked so hard through his whole life, he's been very successful. He has tens of millions of dollars saved up, but he does not feel secure. He does not feel, he, he doesn't feel like he has quite enough. He never has because he doesn't know how much is enough. And if we don't know how much is enough, guess what? Nothing's enough. And so I would encourage you to look at your life and say, what's appropriate? And if I know what's enough for me, between me and Jesus, then if God gives me more, listen to this, if I know what's enough for me and God gives me more, here's what I know. It's not for me. I can be rich toward God. I can be rich toward those in need. And so, so are, is there kind of an attitude in my life that I, I, I want more and more or I can be content with what God's given to me? Know when enough is enough and share freely. Here's another lesson. Beware of the heart's leaning toward greed. I think Jesus is saying, be careful. There's something in every one of us that just sort of, sort of if I naturally lean, do I lean towards generosity and giving things freely or do I lean towards getting more for me? I think most of us, if not all of us, at certain times in our life, we just sort of lean toward, toward greed, toward me. I think it's part of our broken, sinful reality. But Jesus in us can free us to lean towards generosity. And so I think Jesus is saying, be careful. And here, here's the thing. When, when that moment comes, when that month or year or season comes where God overflows blessing on you, and you just, just feel like, God, I've been, you've been so good to me, is the first response, bigger barns, save it for me. Or is the first response, God, how might this be used to overflow and be a blessing to others? Listen again to the, with fresh ears to this story of Jesus. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will restore my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. 
Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. So Lord, teach us what it looks like in our own lives to be rich toward the things of God. Lord, whether we have a little bit in this world's eyes or whether we have a lot, I pray that we would live as generous people who are quick to notice your goodness, who are content and thankful for what you've given to us, and who share freely. Lord, let us discover what, en- what is enough for us, for our life, for our family. Not judging others, but looking into our own hearts and our own lives. And Lord, may we become in just sort of a conduit through which you can pour out your blessing on others, on the world, and on the work you're doing through Jesus Christ. Help us grow in generosity, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus told story after story after story. And after the first service, somebody came and said, why didn't you tell this story of Jesus? And the answer is, because we only had time for four. And there's lots more than that in the Gospel of Luke. But listen to our fourth and final story from the Gospel of Luke told by Jesus. In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with plea. Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. It's easy to misunderstand this story. It goes like this. There's a judge who's hard-hearted, doesn't care about the women, doesn't care care about other people, but this woman comes and she says, I want justice. She knocks on his door and she's pounding, I want justice, and she won't stop. And you know when someone does this long enough, it starts to get a little irritating. The judge finally says, okay, okay, I'll give you what you want. Well, the judge is God and we're the widow and God doesn't want to answer our prayers, but he just does it because he's sick of listening to us, right? Wrong. It'd be easy to listen to that story and think, oh, well, wait a minute now. God's the great judge, and we're coming in prayer asking, and God doesn't answer our prayers because he loves us. He answers our, cares, our prayers because he's tired of our whining. That's not what the story's saying. Some stories in the Bible are a comparison. Some are a contrast. This is not a comparison. God is like the judge, and we're like the widow. This is a contrast. God, who is perfectly just, is waiting to answer our prayers. If, if this widow could get a judge who doesn't care to respond, how much more will God respond when he loves us to start with? And he's waiting to respond. Jesus is making this, this contrast of the heart of God. And so there's at least two lessons that we can look at in this, in this simple story. Here's the first one. There is power in prayer. There is power when we cry out to God. When we talk with God, every time we talk with God, God is listening. God is present. God cares. And I believe the Bible teaches, listen closely, there are things that happen in this world that would not have happened if people hadn't prayed. Do you believe that? I say that again. There's things in this world that happen that would not have happened if God's people hadn't prayed. Prayer has power. And if this widow can get the ear of an unjust, unloving judge, how much more can the children of God have the ear of the God who loves them and who's waiting to hear from them? God is waiting for you to come to him. And so when God will hear you when you confess your sins and he'll remind you and give you grace. He'll hear you when you lift up praise and pray through praise and bring joy to your heart. He will hear you when you lift up the needs that you have or those around you, whether they're emotional needs or financial needs or physical needs or spiritual needs, God is waiting. Prayer has power. Here's a second lesson from this story. Never stop praying, no matter what. I think there's a lesson of persistence that this woman is coming and she continues to press forward, continues to press forward. And for some of us, we grow weary. Man, I've been praying for that wayward son or that wayward daughter for years, for decades. Don't stop praying. There's people who say, Ben, I I married a person and I love Jesus and they don't really know Jesus and 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 and, and it's been been 20 years or 30 years and they don't even even seem like they're getting closer to Jesus. They seem like they're getting more and more hard-hearted. Don't stop 
praying. I don't understand God's timing and God's sovereignty and all of that, but I know that there's power in prayer. Don't stop praying. Continue to pray for whatever the need is that you're growing weary concerning. Maybe it's a person you love that doesn't know Jesus. And you've been praying, Lord, open their heart, soften their heart. Don't stop praying because there's power in prayer. In this story, there's a judge who doesn't care and a widow who keeps on knocking. But the message is that we, the children of God, are loved by our Father and he's listening and ready to respond. So listen again to this passage, this story of Jesus. In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. Thank you, God, that you are... Nothing like that uncaring judge. But you are a loving father who's waiting for your children to come and to ask of you. Teach us to pray with greater persistence, with greater passion, and with greater faith that you are a God who is ready and willing to answer prayer. Teach us to speak with you often and know that you always hear us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite the worship team to come back and join me here on the stage and I want to invite you to understand something. Stories have power. And every one of you who, who has given your heart to Jesus, who follows Jesus, you have stories to tell about God's goodness in your life, God's presence in your life, God's power in your life, how he's changed you. And so I want to encourage you to share your stories with people. If you debate theology with people, you're going to have an argument. If you tell your stories... No one can argue with your story. You want to know why? It's your story. God's present in your life. God is working. Share your stories freely.